Okay, so let's go through the, the, the essential four equations. Now, I'm not going to derive these all necessarily. I'll kind of sketch out on my, you know, on my mouth um, how you would do it if you wanted to derive them. So um, I will label this, and these are in no particular order whatsoever, except for the order that I'm writing them here. There's no reason for it. So uh, I will stick with entirely vector notation. So if you have some velocity at a current time, and if you knew the velocity at some previous time, what would you need to know to calculate that later velocity? Of course, the acceleration and the time. So the velocity to current time was equal to some initial velocity plus some amount of acceleration for a given time duration. Now, this should really be delta t, but, but I'm taking the reasonable approach that we're beginning our timer at, t, at zero so that, you know, delta t is just the same thing as the time that reads on your clock. Now, if your timer began running at, you know, five minutes past the hour, you obviously need to make that, that, that correction. Um, the other thing with all of these equations are going to be assuming that the acceleration, if there is any, will be constant. So you're not going to be like changing from 1g to 2g's to 3g's as you go on. Um, by the way, where does that equation come from? Think about that for a moment. Pause it. Unpause it. This equation comes from our definition of velocity. And specifically, when we define velocity, and then we integrate that velocity over a... Um, no, I'm sorry, I take that back. This definition comes from... Uh, this equation comes from our definition of acceleration. Um, the derivative of velocity. And when you integrate acceleration over time, you get this equation here. So that's left as a proof to the reader, but it's the same, essentially the same thing as I drew up just previously with the connection between displacement and velocity. The second equation now, so, so I misspoke uh, just previously, this comes from the definition of acceleration. The next one, now all you have to do is integrate both sides of this from some initial to final time. What you find here is x of t equals x naught plus v naught of t, or v naught times t, so whatever the initial velocity was, plus, and you should all know this now, a half a, oops, t squared. Now, to be clear, both of these equations and both of the next equations are vector equations. And, and I'll just very quickly write up what that means once I get done with the other two, uh, because it'll apply for all of them. But this equation applies in all four directions. You can put a subscript x in front of everything, or just, you know, the, the letter x. You can put a subscript y in front of v naught y, a y, and so on. Um, and this equation, again, comes from just integrating this with respect to time, and that's what you get. And by the way, the x naught and the v naught there are actually your constants of integration. Once you run uh, d, once you run the velocity through that integral, it, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, so the next equation here is a somewhat weird looking one. It says that the um, distance, actually, let me write it like this: um, the displacement undergone during some time interval, so x final minus x initial, for example, is going to be given as one half your initial velocity plus your final velocity times t. Now, when I, when I don't have a subscript, what I mean by that is it's the same thing as that. I'm just not including the parenthesis t. It's a velocity evaluated at the final time at the end of the interval, not at the beginning time. And that's that displacement during that exact same time interval. Why does this one make sense? Because in this case here, this thing here, if you knew the initial velocity and the final velocity, if it's gradually increasing or gradually decreasing at a constant rate, this is just simply the average velocity. So here, the average velocity times time will give you the displacement. That's the definition of velocity or average velocity under some constant in, uh, uh, acceleration. And fourth, this is the one that I'm not going to drive at all here, but this equation says that your final velocity after some time interval squared, and now if you want to view it as a vector, what you do is you take that vector dot producted with itself, dotted with itself, is equal to v naught squared, and again, what we actually mean here, so I'll, let me do this here. This is a better way to do it. 
the magnitude of the final velocity squared equals the magnitude of the initial velocity plus the way you see it in 1D kinematics is 2A delta x. Once we take this in a proper vector form, both acceleration and displacement are vectors, the way to multiply vectors properly is the dot product. So here's our four equations of kinematics. Each of these allows us to, to solve a slightly different family of problems. And the way that I set this up in a classroom here is I create a cool chart that shows us how to use these in any given situation. Now, before we do that, I had one more thing to mention, and that's the fact that when I write these equations as vectors, I just want to show explicitly what that means. And I'm just going to show, for example, number one. It's the easiest. And I'm going to drop, um, drop the parentheses T here. So equation number one actually means Vx, or the final velocity. I'm, I'm going to omit that. Equals the initial velocity v naught x plus a x t. Same thing in the y. Again, if I don't include a, a v naught subscript, that's the the later or the final velocity. Anyway, v the final y velocity is the initial y velocity plus a y t. The final z velocity is the initial oops, z velocity plus a z. So that's what I mean when I write this equation as a vector. It's strictly three equations that they, it works the same no matter whether you're looking at x, y, or z. And in fact, you're allowed to rotate your coordinate system any arbitrary angle, and these laws are guaranteed to still hold. That, my friends, is one of Einstein's essential assumptions, that physics holds no matter what reference frame you're looking at. So that's a really deep statement. So anyway, let's go ahead and take these equations here these four equations, and I'm going to make a chart of this. And so I'm going to set this chart up here, and we'll come back in a moment. All right, so back over here to camera two. Now, um, what you see is I've gone ahead and drawn kind of a grid on the right. So for each of the four equations, I've made, um, you know, actually it's five columns here. And specifically, these are going to refer to the variables that we use. So, so take a second and count up all the unique individual variables that we have here. Um, and so pause it and just figure out how many individual variables you want to write up on the, head, the headers here, because that's what we're going to do. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with, um, actually, the easier one. Let's look at equ equation number three to start. Notice that here we have, we're dealing with some displacement. And I'm just going to go ahead and write that right here. So we have some displacement. Now, I'm not going to write vector symbols and everything. It's understood that all of these are three-dimensional variables now. So we have a displacement. We have some initial velocity here, v naught. So I'm going to write that here, v naught. We have some final velocity at a later time, t. We have v. We have time. And I'm actually just kind of to keep the train going here. I think you see what the missing one is here. Notice that equation 3 does not include any instance of acceleration, whereas equation 1 includes acceleration, equation 2, and equation 4. And that's really kind of why this table be makes it really easy, because as you, when you look at each of these variables, with the exception of one, you'll find that each of these variables are found in only three of these four equations. Now, what's, the, what's that, that exception? In all four cases, it's assumed that we know the initial velocity coming in. Now, if you don't, there's certain things you can do. For example, you can pretend that you know the final velocity, and then rewind time to find the initial. Um, uh, but I, I, I don't want to get into specific examples here. The point is, though, it's always assumed that we're going to need or that we know or that we have access to the initial velocity vector. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to go ahead and make a... Um, actually, let, let, let's go through this here, and, and I'll explain what I'm going to do. So let's go ahead and look at equation number three. We've already identified we have a delta x, a displacement, we have a v naught, an initial velocity, we have some final velocity, and we have time. So basically, I make a check mark on each of the variables that we have in that equation. Notice that we're missing the acceleration. We take one look up here. We have some initial velocity, we have a final velocity, we have acceleration, and we have time. Equation one doesn't tell us anything about displacement. Now, if you look here, does, is there a displacement in equation two? 
Yes, there is, but it's hidden. You have to swap them around a little bit. When you subtract x0 from both sides, the left-hand side just becomes a displacement. So we do, in fact, have a displacement. We have an initial velocity. We have an acceleration and a time. We have no mention of final velocity in equation 2. And do equation 4 by yourself. I'll just x out real quickly here. x, 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 x. So the, the way that we use this chart now, and this is kind of a nice thing to, you know, as long as you can somehow memorize these equations, which they're not that tough to memorize, you can always recreate this chart once you write them, write them down properly. And if you're ever given a situation where, for example, you're given, um, well, let's say the, the initial velocity, the acceleration, and the time, and you're asked for the final velocity, this chart here is a, essentially a foolproof way to be able to figure that out. So let's just go through that, that exact situation, and I'm going to write down the equations or the values, sorry, the, the parameters that we know. We know what v naught is. Oops. We know what v, um, a is. We know what t is. So that equals something. This equals some value. t equals some value. And our final velocity is the unknown. So each of these is assumed to be a known value there. So typically when I write a problem, the first thing I do is I write my knowns and unknowns, just to be clear, because when you do that, when you look at all four of these, what I'm going to do here is now I'm going to go through the chart and I'm going to eliminate the equations that don't deal with any particular value. So first of all, v naught, that's never going to be a limiting factor. But when we look down to a, the a column, the acceleration, turns out that equation three does not help us to either find or use the acceleration if we know it. So I'm just going to kind of put a negative next to equation 3. Equation 3 is not relevant because we don't have anywhere to put our acceleration. Then we look at the time. We look down here. The fourth equation doesn't make any mention of time. It will never help us solve the final velocity if we know the time because it doesn't appear, appear on the right-hand side. So I'm going to x that out or I'm going to put a minus there. The last one, the final velocity. If I look down here, I see equation 2 does not help us with the final velocity. So that will never be something that we're going to use if we're either trying to solve for b or plug it in to solve for some other variable. So this one right here, equation one. Now, hopefully that was obvious. I, I specifically gave a simple example. But sometimes, you know, especially like if you're given values like this, when you first look at it, it becomes a little bit difficult. How can you actually solve if you don't know the time? But turns out, if you plug it into this equation, you're all golden. So again, the way to go through this chart, once you write it up, you just make sure that you eliminate equation by equation based on the vari variables that you have or you're asked to solve for. So it's really kind of an all-purpose chart for kinematics. It works in all four di uh, dimensions. <laughs> um, three dimensions, sorry, I'm <laughs> going back and forth here. Anyway, um, so, so let's move on to um, uh, Newton's laws and dynamics here, and we'll go through the, the, the slightly more formalistic way of setting those up.